Normbot says they'll serve them to death. Serve them until they become totally dependent upon the androids. But not just the Enterprise crew. All the humans in the whole galaxy will be controlled by the androids. <laughs> Perhaps I could use this as an excuse to go to those far off planets with little polka dotted people if necessary and be able to talk about love, war, nature, God, sex, all those things that go to make up the excitement of the human condition. I'm Captain James Kirk. It's Spock. You'll move, Captain. Jim Kirk of the Enterprise. What's going on? I'm James Kirk. These people are my friend and my shipmate. You leave my crew alone. Out of the question. Oh, about that. James Kirk. It fits like a glove, Captain. All the bonehead ideas. Gentlemen, I'm Captain James Kirk. <laughs> Get out of my chair. Get out of it now. My greetings and felicitations, Captain. So good of you and your officers to, uh, <laughs> drop in. Absolutely smashing. Heldor Joy, everyone, and welcome to Humanist Trek. It's a Star Trek podcast about the humanism in Star Trek. I'm Sarah Ray. And I'm Ali Ashmead. And that was Bajoran, the traditional Bajoran greeting, Heldor Joy. I think that, that sounded familiar. Uh, that's supposed to accompany the burning of the Batarat leaves and renewal scrolls, which you should oh, know yeah. about because you did that on the cruise. I did. I did. I put something. I can't remember what I wrote on the scroll, but I put it in the little flaming box. So that was a really cool ceremony. Well, camping was loads of fun. Uh, everybody yeah. had a great time. Oh, <laughs> too funny. I'm sure no one got eaten by a bear. Nope. No um, bear eatings, I'm sure. And now, like, life never slows down. Now we're headed to Illinois for the weekend for my niece's wedding. So that will be a long drive again because we're doing the like drive through the night 12 hours or whatever Ugh, Ugh, yeah. yeah it's awful that's what's going on in my world what's going on in your world you're I, 50 i'm 50 now it's, it's podcast magic um yeah i'm uh, i'm 50 now thanks i feel pretty young to be 50 yeah. i don't know you don't okay. seem 50 well, I was just telling a friend who's also turned 50, I'm like, you remember when you were a kid and your parents or whoever were 50 and they seemed really old? Yeah. And, and now I'm just like, I'm not that old. <laughs> no. I don't feel that old. Um, I certainly don't act that old. And I, I like to think I don't look that old. So a half a century I've been here. That's wow. crazy. What would you do if, <laughs> if you uh -oh. had the opportunity to have your brain put into an android body so that you could live forever. What would you do then? I, I, I'd do it, maybe. Yeah? Yeah, because I maybe I would do it. I don't mm. know. That's a, mm. is, maybe we'll go. decide as we discuss Star Trek, the original series, season two, <laughs> episode eight, I Mud. Sir, contact with an object. It's moving toward us. No visual contact yet. Reflectors, full intensity. Mr. Sulu. Yes, get Anything on your scanners? It's coming at light speed. Collision course. Visual contact. Anything to work? All wavelengths dominated by ionization effects, sir. All engines full stop. We open in a corridor as Spock and McCoy pass by a crewman in blue, and they exchange a strained good morning, sir. And, and McCoy stops to remark how he thinks there's something odd about this crewman, but he just can't quite figure it out. Well, apparently this guy just came aboard. Spock says Mr. Norman has only been aboard 72 hours, but McCoy's got an intuition. And again, Spock demands some scientific rigor. So McCoy says, well, there's something wrong with a man who never smiles. Conversation <laughs> never varies from anything other than the job and won't talk about his background. <laughs> and Spock says, I see. And then kind of starts to walk away. But, he, but he's basically described Spock here. Mm -hmm. And McCoy and he realizes, to, he realizes yeah, he's done this. He actually sounded regretful. He was trying to smooth it over, knowing that he did kind of insult Spock. And he's like, well, the ears make all the difference. <laughs> what a <God>. dick. <laughs> so he but, tries to make it up by insulting him further. <laughs> yes. Great. That's McCoy. That's McCoy. As usual, Spock isn't baited by McCoy's racism, and he fires back that McCoy's argument is strewn with gaping defects in logic. Well, McCoy says, well, the, this Norman guy, he's avoided appointments with the doctor to do a physical. And, and Spock's like, 
Well, he's probably terrified of your beads and rattles. (laughs) Was he calling him a witch doctor or something? I think so, yes. Okay. Yeah. A a quack, basically. Mm Mm-hmm. Down in auxiliary control, we get a close-up on the authorized personnel-only sign. As Norman enters unauthorized, and as Ensign Jordan turns around, Norman takes him down with what has to be the least powerful karate chop to the neck in all of Star Trek. Yeah. He wasn't even trying. No, no. But he does look like freaking huge compared yeah. to everyone else. He, this dude, whoever they got for this actor, looked like humongous. Mm-hmm. Do you recognize Jordan at all? No. Who sent really? Jordan? Because he was on Star Trek before uh, in season one. Really? And, and he died. What? It's a, this yeah, guy, this so, is a the, uh, reincarnation is real. Wow. <laughs> but, well, the, uh, so the actor. Yes. So not Jordan. Jordan is new, but the actor himself, mm-hmm. Michael Zaslow, he played Lieutenant Darnell in uh, the Salt Monster. Oh, no kidding. Mm hmm. And so he's damned. back as Jordan. Yeah. I was oh. like, I know that guy from somewhere. Yeah. No, I didn't recognize him at all. Norman starts flipping switches and hitting buttons on a couple of consoles, and an overload danger sign lights up, and Sulu registers this as a course change on his panel, and he can't override it, and auxiliary control isn't answering the phone, so Kirk sends security down to aux control and Spock to the bridge as the Enterprise starts banking left on its new heading. Security officer Roe arrives with some other red shirts who carry Ensign Jordan away, and Roe tries to unlock the controls, but they're jammed, and there's no sign of the intruder. Spock arrives on the bridge to find that they're taking an unscheduled ride. Kirk orders Sulu to, again, try to override, and then he calls down to some other department, which I guess was engineering. Yeah, I was um, very confused. Emergency manual monitor is what it was yeah, called. Yeah, and nobody's answering down there. Because Norman has, like, pretty much knocked everybody out. And then I guess then he's heading to engineering. Right. Up to no good down there. First thing he does is, poor Scotty, hits him. Star Trek fight! Knocks him out with another karate chop. And then he karate chops his way through the other crew. And then Scotty kind of wakes up just long enough to report he's here. And then meanwhile, on the bridge, they're going to, like, warp five, warp six. Warp 7, they keep speeding up. Sulu isn't able to cut power. Norman's got all those controls jammed too now. As Kirk hands the bridge to Spock and walks to the turbo lift, the doors open and Norman steps out, grabbing Kirk by the arm. Norman explains that he's in total control of the ship. He's connected the matter-antimatter pods to the main navigational bank with a trigger relay, so if they try to change course or drop below 50 miles an hour, the Enterprise will explode. Spock confirms this, and then Norman confirms what McCoy said earlier. There is something odd about him. He's not human. He keeps saying, you know, we mean you no harm, and he keeps referring to the we we require your ship. Yeah. And then Kirk's like, okay, who, who are we? <laughs> and, and then he pulls up his shirt. He opens a panel in his skin mm-hmm. and he reveals some electronics. Honestly, to me, it looks like a Winamp skin that I used at one point or another. <laughs> I love it. It really whips the llama's ass. <laughs> doesn't, it, doesn't it remind you of like a Winamp, yeah. one of those skins? Yeah. I miss Winamp. <laughs> so... He's apparently an android. Is is this Data's grandpappy? Right? He's got like these uh, like circuit boards and flashy lights in his abdomen. Yeah. And he says, My name is Norm. The enemy of the platypus is man. <laughs> <laughs> After the theme, we're right where we left off. Kirk and Spock remark about how this android is quite sophisticated. Uh, I know there are more androids coming, but if TOS had androids of this level and sophistication, why the hell did TNG make such a big deal about Data being like the only... One of a kind. Yes. Yeah, because as you'll see further on in this episode, there was a whole planet. Yeah. I I didn't understand that. Yeah. So Normbot tells us that he controls the relay trigger. 
and he can't be overcome by physical means. If they fire phasers at him, then the relay trigger trips. Boom. So we'll be on this course for the next four solar days. <laughs> then he folds his arms and he basically shuts his eyes. And he's <laughs> windows, making that window shut down. Cross dissolved to a space shot and Kirk's captain's log fills the passage of time. We're now in orbit around an otherwise uncharted planet. While the log voiceover is playing, we see Normbot still standing on the bridge in standby mode, and Uhura's looking down at her clipboard and almost bumps into him. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think Chekhov like, has to like come in. He came in and he kind of sidestepped him. Yeah. Normbot awakens abruptly and informs Kirk that he will beam down with the science officer, medical officer, communications officer, and navigator. And Kirk's like, Look, any meetings we can have here on the ship. When the hell has Kirk ever turned down the opportunity to beam down to an uncharted planet without any idea of what they're walking into? That's like his <laughs> M.O. Every day, every freaking episode, just about. Who knows? There might um, be some fuckable women down there. I know. Regardless of if they're blue chickens or not. <laughs> They don't have any choice because it's like he's going to destroy the engines and strand the Enterprise forever if they don't if they don't beam down. Normbot's like, well, you can come with me or be destroyed. And Kirk's like, wow, how gracious. Normbot <laughs> says, you people have a word that doesn't have any meaning to us, but you seem to think a lot of it. Please. So I guess that was the trick. Yeah. The away team materializes in a cave on the planet. And this looks somewhat familiar to me. As a set, too. Normbot announces that the planet is K-type, adaptable for humans by the use of pressure domes and life support systems. Normbot walks to a door in the room, which is flanked by what look like twin women. Very, like, go-go 60s looking in their hair and dress. One of them says, he is waiting. And the other one says, if you will follow us, please. Through the door is a throne room. Two more identical women flank the throne, and sitting in the throne is fan favorite Harcourt Fenton Mudd himself. And Kirk's like, well, slap me on the ass and call me Sally. I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if they brought him back because he was a fan favorite. They, uh, I, yeah. I think that was probably one of the most entertaining episodes when mm -hmm. he first appeared. So I'm thinking probably the fans. Yeah. Well, I remember as a youth, you know, enjoying the mud episodes, I, I, I guess because the, the actor was so good in that character. He was lovable and hateable and funny mm -hmm. too. He was a, and then, you know, wherever Harry mud was, there were going to be scantily clad women as well. <laughs> of so. course. Mud insists on being called mud. The first ruler of this entire sovereign planet. Kirk demands control of his ship returned, and he tries to call up the Enterprise, but Mud says, Alice, and one of the women reaches out and crushes Kirk's star tack in her hand. <coughs> Chekhov, who wasn't with us for the first Harry Mud episode, is like, no. you, you know this guy? And we get a fun yep. little back and forth between Kirk and Mud. Kirk calls him a thief, swindler, con man, liar, and rogue. And mm -hmm. throughout this, Mud keeps interrupting, like protesting this characterization of him. Kirk says he belongs in jail, which is where I thought I left you, Mud. What's the story? Mud's like, well, that's a long story, but hey, check out this planet. Like, I really think you're going to enjoy it. <laughs> Kirk demands that they release the Enterprise, but Mud isn't quite ready to allow that. In fact, he evil monologues about how he hopes they start enjoying themselves, since they'll likely spend the rest of their lives here. And Mud laughs hysterically into the commercial. Again, Kirk demands his ship released, and Mud's like, well, that's against the law I just made up. <laughs> <laughs> My law. Decreed yeah. by Mud the First, voted in by the resident population. Aren't they lovely? And from both his <laughs> left and right, he motions for more of these women to come stand in a line with the others. 
Mudd says he's had 500 of these identical robots made up to serve him, all identical, beautiful, compliant, and obedient. Oh my. They're all, these particular ones are called Alice. They're the Alice class. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, my name is Alice, right? Mm -hmm. It's my government name is Alice. I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh. So, and each of them wear like this little dog bracelet <laughs> thingy around their neck and with a number on it. But yeah, they pretty much will provide anything you want. They're com beautiful, compliant, and obedient. Spock is like, 500 of the same woman doesn't that get kind of old after a while but mud has a particular fondness for this model which he says spock is ill-equipped to appreciate <laughs> kirk wants to hear the story of how mud escaped prison and ended up here again and the story is that mud formed an llc bringing modern tech to backward planets providing them with valuable patents if he were Starfleet or the Federation, what he's done would have been a violation of the Prime Directive. This is definitely 1960s language. The way they talk about like patents and royalty payments. Royalties. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Which, of course, he did not pay. Quite the contrary, Mudd's like, as a free market capitalist pig, I found myself in a rather ambiguous conflict as a matter of principle. And Spock very dryly adds, he did not pay royalties. <laughs> <laughs> so he was basically reselling patents and then he actually got caught on Deneb 5 trying to sell a Vulcan fuel synthesizer to the Denebians and then he was sentenced to death and I think they started naming off all the different <laughs> yeah. types of death. Death by hanging, um, uh, torture. Ele electrocution, death so. by gas, by death by phaser. <laughs> Mud's like, fucking police, no sense of humor. A cab. Do you know what the penalty for fraud is? And then Spock lists all of these ways to die. And yep. Mud's like, yeah, AOL keyword death. <laughs> Hashtag death, but they didn't have hashtags. But the, yeah. This next little keyword. exchange was kind of fun too. Mud says, death, barbarians. Well, of course I left. And Kirk says, he broke jail. Mud says, mm -hmm. I borrowed transportation. And Kirk says, he stole a he spaceship. Stole a ship. <laughs> Mud says the patrol reacted in a hostile manner, and Kirk says they fired they at him. They shot at him. I <laughs> love that little translation back and forth. It was so fun. Yep. Mud was able to escape, but the ship was damaged. He didn't have navigation, so he just sort of wandered aimlessly through uncharted space and ultimately ended up here. And Spock's like, well, you went through a lot of trouble to get here. There must be a compelling motive. And Mud leans forward and says, Spock, you're going to love it here. They all talk <laughs> just like you do. <laughs> uh, of course, Spock is always the brunt of a joke. Mud talks about how he's on this planet with over 200,000 of these androids, all existing to serve him. And he says, it's absolute paradise. But his face conveys it's anything but paradise. And Spock asks, what's the problem then? Well, they won't let Mud leave. They want to study He's him. He's gotten bored. Can you believe that? Like, paradise is no longer paradise. But yeah, they want to study him. <laughs> they want to study and humans, and Kirk's like, well, they picked a fine representative. <laughs> they picked the worst. Well, actually, I guess he just, they just lucked out with Mud because he's the worst example. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the androids have learned all they can from Mud. So he promised he would find more humans for them to study. A prime sample, a starship captain, bright, loyal, fearless, imaginative. And he's like, so you're going to take over for me and I'm going to get the fuck out of here. Kirk isn't having any of that, but Mud insists and calls for Normbot and the Alice's to take mm. them to quarters. And together they all respond. Yes, yes my, my Lord, Lord Mud. <laughs> Creepy. As they're walking out. McCoy notices this really dark patch in the wall and he's like, what's that? Mm -hmm. And then Mud talks about where he amuses himself by <laughs> ha having made a replica of his wife, Stella. And he flips up the black screen and there she is. She's mm -hmm. kind of a horrid looking woman with red hair, very severe, mad looking. And he can wake her up and finally get the last word by 
just turning her off whenever in mid sentence. He's like, she urged me to go into space. Not that she meant to, just her constant <laughs> nagging drove me to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so he had the androids create this replica to remind him how much she annoyed him. So he's like, every time I think about her, I go further into space. <laughs> I can't imagine a woman marrying him. But yeah, he calls her by name and the android comes to life and starts nagging at him. Mm, Harcourt, Harcourt, Fenton, Mud, what have you been up to? Nothing good, I'm sure. Well, let me tell you, you lazy good for nothing. Shut up. Think, think, think. <laughs> Marvelous. I finally have the last word with her. In some living area, the crew tries to get some information from the androids. Normbot says that their makers came from the Andromeda galaxy. They were humanoid, but unlike humans, they make great use of robots. The robots performed the necessary functions so that the makers could evolve a perfect social order. Their home planet's sun went nova, and only a few exploratory outposts survived, but the makers' race ultimately died out over time. So now the androids serve mud. They needed a purpose, and mud gave them a purpose again. So Kirk asked the, the androids to leave the room, yeah. <laughs> and they both, the Alice's, chirp up, and they're like, why? And he's like, because we don't like you. And then he makes this gesture like <laughs> uh, like a shoe. Shoe, get out of here. Yes. After the androids leave, I can't remember who spoke up first. Kirk asks and for opinions and Chekhov says, opinions. I think we're in a lot of trouble. And Kirk's like, gee, that's helpful, Bones. And Bones goes, I, I agree with Chekhov. Yeah, we're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and Kirk goes, Spock, and I swear to God, if you don't say we're you in say trouble. <laughs> And he's like, well, we are. <laughs> but he thinks that the number of androids in their interactions are such that they, there's no way they could operate independently. He's like, there's got to be some kind of central control system somewhere which guides the entire android population. OK, why would that be the logical assumption? Why couldn't these androids be autonomous? Yeah, and so advanced because they, yeah. they've got to present a well, they've got to present a flaw, you know. Right, right. That's foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. But but we haven't seen anything to suggest that they're all connected to like Windows Server 2000 Advanced somewhere. Mm, right, or NT Server or something. Mm. They decide to split up. Spock's going to look for the server. The others are going to try to learn whatever they can, and Kirk's going to look for mud. Spock is in a computer room with Normbot and a couple of other androids, and Spock starts probing. This is a most unusual device, and Normbot shares that it's their central control complex. Well, Norm has now changed clothes, and he's wearing, like, this white leotard, unitard, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. And he's, he's got his hands <laughs> around a glowing... Uh, Phallic shaped stone. Boy, 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 boy. <laughs> <laughs> when Spock asks about there being 200,000 of them, Normbot says 207,809. Spock thinks this is a simple relay station and asks if they are all controlled from here when Normbot's number necklace starts flashing, which Spock <laughs> visibly takes note of. And after a few mm -hmm. seconds, Normbot comes back with. I am not programmed not to respond programmed in that area. To respond in this area. <laughs> I love that. So Spock has learned a lot in this little interaction. Meanwhile, Kirk and Uhura are being shown some different android women, which Alice Bot two sixty three says are the Barbara series. There's <laughs> there's also the Macy series, the Trudy series, and one of Mud's favorites, the Annabelle series. That's the one that was programmed to like anal. I bet. <laughs> My. Annabelle, which one? Annabelle likes anal, and that's why Mud has a particular <laughs> fondness for there that model. There must be a joke I'm not getting. Probably, is there a joke? She I'm likes not anal. I don't know. <laughs> I was like, Annabelle, though, is it? Is there a joke? Is there a porn star, Annabelle? Oh, I don't know. No, I don't know. I'm sure. Oh. Kirk's like, don't you like male androids, Harry? And Harry sort of stammers around an answer. 
the Alice's were talking about the Barbara's and their body is covered with a self-renewing plastic over a skeleton of beryllium titanium alloy. They have yet to have an android body wear out. They're estimated to last 500,000 years. And this has Uhura shook. And not yeah. only that, Alice 263 says that their medical robots are able to put a human brain in an android body. Bonus. And I thought, so, oh, like the golems in Picard? I didn't, I don't like that as a concept. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and you asked earlier, would I do it? Mm -hmm. Would I? I don't, would you? I don't, I don't know. know because we'll get there. <laughs> we, we pause on Uhura a moment as she appears to be contemplating this ability to become immortal. Back in the living area, Spock is about to report to Kirk what he's learned from Normbot when McCoy and Mud arrive. And McCoy has been down to the lab and he can barely contain his excitement, says he could spend the rest of his life studying it. But Kirk reminds him that they are not staying here. I know they've all just kind of like forgotten. <laughs> hey, you're trapped. Uh, who is thinking about immortality? Mm -hmm. McCoy is taken with their research lab. So, yeah, it's, it's a bit weird. Alice Bot shows up dragging Scotty and Kirk is surprised to see him since he was ordered to stay on the ship. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently. It took me a moment. Yeah, I, it, it, me too. I was like, wait, was he on the. Oh, wait a minute. He no, wasn't, he on, the wasn't on the away team. team. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But apparently Mud beamed up a few dozen bots who have been beaming the crew to the surface. In fact, all of the crew are here on the planet now. Kirk loses his shit at hearing this and puts his hands around Mud's throat and like backs him up to a wall because you just can't leave a ship like that without a crew. But there is a crew. The androids have taken over the Enterprise. After the break, Kirk lets go of Mud and tells him he'll never get away with this. Starfleet will stop him, but Mud reminds him that the Enterprise is as fast as any ship in the fleet, so how are they going to catch him? Harry and Alice Bot leave, and Spock is like, I've been talking to the androids. They're loyal to Mud. They could easily pull this off, but worse, these androids can provide anything anyone could want. How will the mm -hmm. crew react to this? Well, Kirk's already worried because he's feeling like they might be tempted. Yeah. Um, Chekhov, at the moment, is sitting on the throne and being uh, serviced by two <laughs> Alices. He's just enjoying all this attention a great deal. And I'm thinking, what happened to uh, Liz at Landon? Yeah, what was her name? Yeah. Was it Landon? How, yeah. Uh, how, She's, how quickly uh, we picture. forgot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So he's like, man, too bad you're not real girls. And they're like, oh, we are. We're, we've been programmed to function as real human girls. I mean, yeah, I'm programmed, programmed in multiple techniques. techniques. Yes. Oh, I love that. that <laughs> I have repeated that myself a few times. <laughs> oh, that was one of my favorite episodes. But then he says, man, this place is even better than Leningrad. But Scotty, on the other hand, he's like looking at their engineering facilities and he's like, he learns like like he can have exclusive use of their facilities if he wants. So, yeah, Kirk's got to worry about all of them. Mud and Kirk enter the room and Scotty does the same thing McCoy did, gushing to Kirk about how, like, how great this engineering tech lab is. And Kirk's like, Jesus, Mud, is this your plan? Hit my people at their weakest point? Normbot says they just want to make the humans comfortable and learn from them. Back in the living area, Kirk is trying to figure out how to get out of there, but the rest of the crew are distracted by all the things the androids have offered. All the labs, anything they want, Uhura was offered a robot body and immortality. <laughs> so, in a way, we kind of revisit this idea of paradise again. We also revisit another theme going all the way back to the pilot, the cage, that a cage, no matter how nice, is still just a cage. A cage is a cage. Yep. Alice Bot shows up and asks if they require anything. And Kirk's like, I require my ship. But Alice Bot says she's not programmed. And Kirk finishes <laughs> to respond in that area. Yeah, yeah, we know. He says that the, the Enterprise is the only thing he wants. He would not be happy without it. And the Enterprise is a beautiful woman, he calls it. Yeah. And we love her. 
<laughs> a few times here, he sets up these logic loops that, you know, to try mm -hmm. to, we play this game again, catch a computer in a logic loop. So yeah. he, he says, give us back our ship. That will please us. And Alice Bot's like, we are programmed to serve. We will serve you to your best interests to make you happy. But Kirk says, but we're unhappy here. And Alice Bot doesn't understand what that even means. So Spock explains that it's the state that occurs in the human when wants and desires are not fulfilled. Which desires are not fulfilled? We want the Enterprise back. Alice Bot's necklace starts flashing, indicating mm -hmm. that the logic loop is starting to work. But Alice Bot comes back and says the Enterprise is a mechanical device. It can't be a want or desire. And Kirk says, no, it's a beautiful lady and we love her. And this sends Alice Bot into a freak out. She's like, illogical, does not compute, all <laughs> units relate. And then she says, Norman, coordinate. And her necklace mm. stops flashing and goes solid. And she says, unhappiness does not relate. We must study this. And she leaves. Kirk and Spock exchange a fascinating, indicating they're both following what just happened. Kirk asks McCoy if he's had a chance to study the android's psychological readings. And McCoy's like, yeah, good luck with these ones. They're perfect in every way, right down to their sense of purpose. <laughs> now, Kirk's worried about his crew falling for the android's paradise offerings and thinks they need a little sense of purpose, too. In the throne room, it looks like Mud is saying his goodbyes to some of the androids. And Kirk's got some questions lined up for him, but Mud's like, gee, I haven't the time. My bags are packed and we'll be leaving on the Enterprise in less than 24 hours. Kirk asks for his ship back again, and Mud's like, damn, you are stubborn, but that's okay. I'll be gone soon, and you can be as stubborn as you want. And as he walks over to the alcove, he says, like, one last time, and he flips the switch and calls to Stella, <laughs> and Stella comes to life again and starts berating Harry. And then he just wants to basically have the last word. <laughs> he shuts her off and says, shut up, <laughs> just to have that one last word. So then he goes and he says to the androids to, hey, transfer my bags to the ship. And then surprisingly, they mm. all say, no, no, they won't let him leave now. It turns out the logic loop worked again, mm. as it always mm -hmm. does. They can't, I didn't think it was going to work that way, but <laughs> yeah. They can't take orders from him anymore. And Normbot says their makers programmed them to serve. He says mm -hmm. they recognized that mud was flawed, but it wasn't until they had other humans to study that they determined the whole species is self-destructive and needs the android's help. Kirk tries to explain that they prefer to help themselves. Thank you very much. Like we do make mistakes, but that's all part of being human. Normbot announces that they won't harm anyone, but they are taking the Enterprise and all the humans will have to remain on the planet. They cannot allow such a greedy and corruptible race to have free run of the galaxy. Boy, if ain't that the truth. <laughs> I know. But I'm wondering, like, how, if they're connected to a central computer, how are they going to leave the, well, I guess they could take it with them. I don't know. Yeah, probably. Harry tries again to get an Alice bot to beam up his bags, but she shoves him backward and he lands on his ass. And Spock's like, you know, I'm more like you androids than these fucked up humans. Uh, Take me! <laughs> how do you intend to stop them? And Normbot says, they'll serve them to death. Serve them until they become totally dependent upon the androids. They'll be able to control their aggressive and acquisitive instincts. And Spock's like, yep, that works. Sounds good. Good plan you got there. <laughs> Have a safe trip. But not just the Enterprise crew. All the humans in the whole galaxy will be controlled by the androids. <laughs> Back from the break, the crew is gathered in the living area along with Harry. Spock suggests whatever they decide to do, they'd better do it fast because the androids only have to install a few cybernetic devices on the Enterprise and then they'll be able to leave. And McCoy's like, how do you know that? And Spock says, oh, I asked them. <laughs> Since they don't really think that the, the humans can do any kind of damage, they were just like, we will answer your questions. Mud's like, Kirk, you and your pointy-eared thinking machine here are pretty smart because everybody's <laughs> got to get on on the Spock attacks, apparently. Apparently, that's the thing to do. 
Scotty says that androids and robots aren't capable of independent creative thought. And Spock adds that there's no way this central control device can handle the massive task of controlling over 200,000 androids. He says there are many Alice's, Trudy's, Macy's, Annabelle's, even Herman's, Oscar's, and many more, but only one Normbot. Norman. Yeah. So they conclude that each of these robots functions as one component of a mass brain linked together through Normbot. The glowing necklaces indicate their minds in operation. And then when Alice was had a, one of the Alice's had a processing issue earlier, she kind of asked for Norman to coordinate. Mm-hmm. So that kind of alludes to, OK, Norman is something important in their hierarchy somehow. And they're hoping that their logical nature will be Normbot's ultimate downfall. So we need more logic puzzles, lots of irrationality, and direct it all right at Normbot. Shit like, what does purple taste like? And stuff like that, you know? (laughs) Honestly, this plan was hilarious, and uh, I actually enjoyed it. It was so great. It was great. The first thing is, Mud, of course, is now in captivity with them. So he's like, okay, well, you know, I'm going to obviously be part of the plan. And then McCoy gets out the hypo spray (laughs) and he's like, wait, wait. But one of the plans is to knock him out and then tell the androids that he's going to die if they don't get back to Enterprise and get to their medical supplies. Mud's knocked out by this hypo spray and Kirk and Scotty kind of catch him and are carrying him in their arms. And Kirk says, oh, Harry, I do believe you're putting on weight. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) In the throne room, Kirk presses a button on the chair and an Alice bot shows right up. Kirk says there's a medical emergency with mud and McCoy needs access to the medical equipment on the Enterprise to save his life. But Alice says the Enterprise is off limits to the humans. But Kirk plays logic puzzle again and tells her Mm -hmm. that they're programmed to serve... And if McCoy doesn't get his equipment and Mud dies, the androids will have failed to serve. Alice Bot looks off, like far off into the distance as her necklace lights up for a few moments. And she finally says, I am directed to observe the situation. So again, there's something controlling, some central thing controlling them all. Kirk leads her back to their room where she asks, if they take Mud to their sick bay, will he be repaired? And as Kirk says, yes, Uhura jumps in and says, no, 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 they're lying. It's a trick. (laughs) And she tells them all about how they injected something into mud to make him look sick. Sprinkle a little truth in anything, Mm -hmm. and it's valid. I mean, I thought that was genius. Alice Bot refuses the request, and Kirk's like, what the fuck, Uhura? Why did you tell her? (laughs) Uhura says... I want that android body after all. I want immortality. Young and beautiful forever. Are you fucking kidding me? Hell yeah. Alice Bot confirms they'll hold up their end of the deal uh, to Uhura. And after she leaves the room, Kirk's like, mm-hmm. Uhura, beautiful. Like, that was the best acting. She He walks over and picks her up by the arms. I thought that was cute. It was so yeah. good. Uhura says, I even half believed it myself. <laughs> I'm like, right? Of course. So it was all part of the plan. Well, but the plan isn't over, man. This was hilarious to me. So they go and they put their real plan in action, which is basically this pantomime bullshit. um, That (laughs) that scene after scene. I was even confused. So they're in the throne room, and Doc and Scotty are out standing outside (laughs) on either side of the doors, swishing doors. They bow to each other, the doors open, and they pretend to play <laughs> instruments, um, like like uh, string instruments, violins, and then in come Chekhov and Uhura, <laughs> who are doing a waltz, and the Alices are like, what the fuck? And Kirk says they're celebrating. They're celebrating their captivity. And they're like, music? What is this? What is happening? <laughs> Does not compute music. This is the second time that music has thrown off a computer. Uh-huh. So all of this stuff is confusing the Alice bots and their necklaces are flashing and beeping. (laughs) As the dance ends, Chekhov thanks Scotty and McCoy and then turns to thank Uhura, who thanks him back and then slaps him hard across the face, knocking him (laughs) down. And Alice bots like, why did she strike him? And Kirk explains because she likes him. Then he tells Chekhov to get up (laughs) and stand there absolutely still. 
But and so he gets up and then he does this like ballerina type bow and then he starts to do Russian dancing, like the kicking and the, the, the co- squatting. The Cossack dance. Yeah, the Cossack dance. And then everybody starts clapping, <laughs> everybody meaning Scotty, McCoy, and Uhura. And they're starting to hey, hey. And then this confuses them even more to where they lean their head over and they kind of have like a blue screen of death moment where they just kind of shut down. General protection fault, whatever you want to call it. Right. You remember you remember uh, those? <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in the lab, Spock is wooing a couple Alice bots with his logical mind and he tries to neck pinch one of them. <laughs> <laughs> but nothing happens and she's like uh is this supposed to have some significance and spock says to alice 27 i love you and turns to alice 210 and says however i hate you and this does not compute they're identical and spock says that is exactly why i hate you because you are identical and the alice bots necklaces start going bonkers until they light up solid and the androids get the blue screen of death shut down so now is Norman's turn. Now they got to go after him, the real Norman. This is the boss level. Yeah. So they all go in to, to see Norman. And we actually get the actor that plays Harry Mudd to do some kind of Shakespearean diatribe. Mm-hmm. Kirk demands Normbot to surrender. But he's like, you're kidding, right? We're faster and stronger than you. But Kirk <laughs> counters, no, no, no. We're stronger and we'll prove it. He says... Can you harm a man that you're programmed to serve? And of course, the answer Mm. is no. But Mud leaps into action and insists that they have done exactly that and launches into this hero speech about humans can't survive on bread alone and the nourishments of liberty and freedom. (laughs) I knew you had written that down. McCoy and Scotty pretend to be robots talking about how the androids only offer them well-being, but food, drink, and happiness mean nothing to them. They must work and suffer and labor without end. That's the only way they can be happy. Essentially, in order to be happy, they must be unhappy. So more logic loops. All of the Alice's necklaces start flashing and beeping now, and Normbot catches this illogical contradiction and asks Spock to explain. And Spock's explanation is perhaps the most chaotic of all, He leans into Normbot and says, Logic is a little tweeting bird chirping in a meadow. Logic is a wreath of pretty flowers which smell bad. Are you sure your circuits are registering correctly? Your ears are green. (laughs) What the (laughs) fuck, man? I know, it was like a mind fuck, but it was genius. It was genius. So good. On cue, Scotty comes to the middle of the room, clutching his chest and crying, I kind of go on. I'm tired of happiness. I'm tired of comfort and pleasure. I'm ready. Kill me. Kill me. And the others point finger guns at him and whistle. As he falls to the floor and McCoy I pronounces him dead. Fell out. I fell out. <laughs> this is like Star Trek characters do improv. Yeah, pretty much. And then, All right, here's your um, scene. Uh, you're going to kill McCoy with your fingers <laughs> and go scene <laughs> <laughs> or a prop or, or what is it the i want to do improv scenes so bad yeah see yeah scenes yeah, from, yeah, a, hat from a hat props. yes normbot is in but, disbelief you can't have killed him without weapons kirk bends down and takes scotty in his arms and explains he died of too much happiness but now he's happier he's dead and they'll miss him <laughs> And he says, let's hear it for our poor dead friend. And they all laugh hysterically. (laughs) Kirk says, what is a man but that lofty spirit, that sense of enterprise, that devotion to something that cannot be sensed, cannot be realized, but only dreamed the highest reality. And that one confuses Normbot even more. Dreams are not real. Kirk says their logic is to be illogical. He asks Spock for the explosive. And this was a fun little bit of acting. Oh. <laughs> so they literally had a basically pan. I don't I guess you could yeah. call it pantomiming yeah. where you have a fake something in your hands. It's clearly not there. So they take the explosives and he looks like he molds it into a shape. Mm-hmm. Kirk's like, don't you think that's too much for our purpose? 
Like that looks like a lot. And Spock kind of pretends to weigh it. And he's like, no, this is the right amount. (laughs) Norm looks so confused right now. Yes. Harry Mudd go across the room is like okay i'm ready this is so down good. on his knees and he puts his hands up as if he's gonna catch it so then spock <laughs> fakes and it's funny to see spock playing along with this yes but so spock fake throws it and harry mud catches it but looks like he bobbles it mm-hmm. but then catches it behind his back norm still confused <laughs> then he says to mccoy to give him some like fuses. Yeah. Just like one by one, he asks for some items. He's like detonator, fuse, primer. And after each item, McCoy like slaps his hand as if he's handing him the item that he asked for. And he's rigging up a bomb, puts it on the floor. And then he asks for the last thing was whatever the slang is for a golf club. Mashy. Which I think. Mashy. Yeah. And he's about to basically knock this fake Mm -hmm. bomb into oblivion but right before it they all yell four (laughs) (laughs) and then he swings they all go boom and act like they uh, appear to you know they pretend to react to an explosion it didn't really happen but then i guess that was too much for norman the alice bots shut down and the final blow comes in the form of one more logic loop norman insists there was no explosion and harry says i lied I guess there's some type of literature uh, called the liar's paradox where it's it says everything I say is a lie. I am lying. Am I a liar or not? Right. And that was too much for Norman because his head starts smoking. <laughs> 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 his head starts smoking. That was so funny. I think this is like the third time they've done a logic loop on a robot. Or computer, Type. or yeah, I think mm-hmm. so. His head is smoking, and he asks for an explanation. And Kirk replies, "I am not programmed to respond in that area." <laughs> and that's enough to shut Normbot down. Mud is impressed and suggests that he and Kirk should enter into some kind of partnership agreement. And right. Kirk's like, "You and me? Uh, yeah, fucking right." But he's got another idea. And the button on the episode, in the throne room, KSM have chair chat, and McCoy takes the opportunity to gloat to Spock. He says, we found a whole world of minds that work just like yours. Logical, unemotional, (laughs) completely pragmatic, and we poor, irrational humans whip them in a fair fight. Now you find yourself back among us illogical humans again, and Spock replies, which I find eminently satisfactory, Doctor. For nowhere am I so desperately needed as among a shipload of illogical humans. <laughs> <laughs> Mud is being led into the room by a couple of Alice bots, and he's hollering about being made to stay on the planet. And Kirk explains that, like, this is your parole. The androids are being reprogrammed to adapt the planet for productive use again. And Mud's like, well, what the hell am I going to do? I'm not a scientist. And Kirk says, no, you're an irritant. <laughs> oh i loved that and he tells him he'll stay here on this planet and be an example to the androids of a human failure (laughs) perfect harry makes a lap around the room ogling the hot robots like trump backstage at a miss america pageant Mm -hmm. and when you're a star they let you do it you can do anything (laughs) whatever you want and he's like you know i could probably live with this i can live with this they're still gonna provide him with everything he wants so he's like, okay, this isn't too bad. Kirk's like, oh, one more thing, Harry. And Just sa- for you. Says they've programmed the special android attendant to care for his needs and give him an incentive to work with the androids instead of exploiting them. And out pops Stella number one, who starts in on her henpecking. And when Mud tries to tell her to shut up, like he did before, you know, which shut her down, he gave him the last word, but it, she's been reprogrammed sorry. and that doesn't work anymore. And then Stella number two comes out from a different doorway and lays into him too. And as he tries to leave, Stella 500 comes into the room. And that's when he sees the 500 on her little necklace thing. And he's like, 500? Kirk, you can't do this to me. (laughs) And Kirk's like, look, Harry, I try not to make a habit of marooning people on a planet. This is like my second time. You still remember, Admiral. I cannot help but be touched. 
And the Starfleets leave the room and off we go to our next adventure. Do you think, did we see Harry Mudd again? Because he's obviously still alive and he's a, uh, he has a knack for escaping. But do we see him again? I don't think we see him again until Discovery. Okay. But that's like adjacent to this. Yeah. In the timeline. Boy, I'm sure glad that's over with. I'm happy the affair is over. Me too. A most annoying emotional episode. Yeah, but you know, I learned something today. When dreams become more important than reality, you give up travel, building, creating. One jealous god, if all this makes a god. By sparing your helpless enemy, who surely would have destroyed you, you demonstrated the advanced trait of mercy. Frankly, I was rather dismayed by your use of the term half-breed. You must admit, it is an unsophisticated expression. I guess... Paradise isn't always what we think it is. Again, this is like the sixth Paradise episode then. Like um, androids wanting to understand humanity, but in turn destroy themselves because they learn what humanity is. I don't know. You know what I mean? Humanity is complicated and complex and has no logic to it and they cannot compute. And so they always like kind of shut down when they are presented with this logic loop. Yeah. I definitely think there is something to be said for the consistent approach of logic in this problem solving, right? Like that's, that is a definite thing that pulled through the whole series, but definitely in this episode with the way they kept feeding those logic loops to, you know, to try to break the, break the robots. And I don't know, this was a toughie other, again, like you said, the idea of paradise, like having androids cater to your every need. Yeah. I mean, do you want to live forever? In a body, yeah, that's, that's one. I always do. gonna be beautiful, and I, 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 I would just worry about like your brain isn't gonna maybe not necessarily live forever, but because man, your brain is what you are, right? To be honest, man, I'm having a, know. I'm having a weed moment right now because <laughs> I'm having a weed moment this whole episode. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck. No, I'm doing. because I swear to God, I wrote down something about the way they portrayed, you know the do you want to live forever? And like, I think about this in terms of how I used to think about heaven, the idea of heaven and how I think about it now, which is like, no, I don't want to fucking live forever. Are you kidding me? Like I, even if you're in quote unquote paradise, like eventually you're going to get bored and run out of shit to do. And you know, like, yeah. Harry Mudd was bored. So that's, he was ready to get the fuck out of there. Yeah. No, I don't want to be immortal. I don't want to live forever. I mean, I, it would be cool if I knew my body would, could withstand it. I kind of want to just be around to see what happens. If I could only be an observer and not have to take part, I don't know. You should join the Q continuum. I'd be a traveler. I'd be happy Ooh, to be a traveler. There you go. It's like I want to see what happens, but I don't necessarily want to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want to be an observer because it's, I think there's going to be some difficult things in like 500 years of time, there's yeah. going to be some difficult things to see. And For sure. Let's get right to business. Fine, I'm authorized to pay an equitable price. Federation has invested a great deal of money in our training. They're about due for a small return. Listen, we pay our percentages. We're entitled to a little service for our money, huh? Is this the way your citizens do business? They're right of petition. They pay their percentages and the boss takes care of them. <laughs> <sighs> Is there anything else? There are a lot of great ways to help support the show. One of the free ways to do that is to leave a rating and review wherever you happen to listen to this podcast. One of the best ways to support us, though, is to toss some gold press latinum in the plate as we pass it around (laughs) by becoming a patron of the show. (laughs) Not a church reference, no. Oh, my God. Uh, We also want to thank our founding admirals. Special thanks to Russell, Ali, Peter, and Sarah. Patrons get early access to every episode. There are various merch rewards at different levels. So head to patreon.com slash humanist trek and pledge as little as $3 a month. And that will go a long way to supporting us and the su- production of the show. I assume you're loitering around here to learn what efficiency rating I plan to give your cadets. Trainees, to the briefing room. Is that all you got to say? What about my performance? Aren't you dead? I don't believe this was a fair test of my command abilities. There was no way to win. There's no correct resolution. It's a test of character. Now, what is that supposed to mean? I am understandably curious. May I ask you a question? Who's been holding up the damn elevator?
All right, let's bring Becca back in for the exciting conclusion to last week's Starfleet Academy Cadet Challenge. Last week, you asked us. In this episode, Roger C. Caramel. Caramel? 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 Caramel. Carmel. Nailed it. Carmel. In this episode, Roger C. Carmel reprises his role as Harry Mudd. Why is this significant? We came to an agreement on this, that he is the first guest star to appear a second time in Star Trek. I'm going to give you that one. Yay! Yay! With the exception of the actors who played members of the Enterprise crew, Roger C. Carmel was the only actor to play the same character in more than one episode. Oh, the only actor. He was the only actor. Shit. Nice. That's and I think it was because it was, they, I think he was a fan favorite. I think the first one, I think we talked about this during the episode. I'm like, why do you think he came back? I think he comes back for a lot of the same reasons that Q comes back. Mm. People it's just cannot a get a likable character that, yeah. Yeah. A likable evil character. Yeah. So next week, we will be reviewing season two, episode nine, Metamorphosis. The shuttlecraft Galileo makes a forced landing on a world with a single human inhabitant. I have no idea what this episode is. But Do we're you... back on the Galileo, the, the shuttlecraft. Yeah, apparently. I couldn't tell you what this episode is about. The, it, I'm, I think I'm being pulled from, there's an episode of The Next Generation mm-hmm. that I believe may even use the <clears throat> same title, but that's about this like, oh, is that the one that's about the the princess girl or whatever from this alien species who's in an egg and the egg gets opened too soon and she transforms from one being into another, like a metamorphosis, like a butterfly sort of thing. I don't know. No I got, idea. I got nothing. What's her question? <laughs> and we're going to hate you. She has this <clears throat> evil look on Listen, her face. I do feel bad about this no, one. No, you don't. This one is a really, really difficult thing to scout. Okay. There was just nothing. A Gold Key Comics comic book was released what? as a sequel to this episode. This isn't fair. What was it titled? <laughs> <laughs> this isn't fair at all. What? A, a gold a comic key. book. A comic book. Sure. Get the fuck out of here. Come on, nerds like comic books. Hey, nerds. Where's your comic books? <laughs> I didn't get to have any comic books when I was. So I don't know. Well, I didn't get to have birthday cake, so. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's way worse. That's way worse. Um, what was it called? Uh, Metamorphosis, the sequel. No, uh, like Spaceballs. It's Metamorphosis, the comic book. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Actually, great guess. No. <laughs> nothing. I got nothing. I have no idea. Okay. Stab in okay. the dark. Wild guess. Go. It's got to be a Marvel thing, I guess. Um, uh, Batman. <laughs> Batman. Uh, Batman. I'm going to go with like something stupid, like Metamorphosis 2, part two. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. No idea. Uh, all right. Well, you'll find out with us next week when we get the answer to whatever the fuck out of the nowhere <laughs> question this was. I told you. Was Listen, the reason it was so hard was because all of the other stuff was about how it was uh, the, the Enterprise wasn't even in this episode until like 27 minutes in or whatever it was. OK, <laughs> but like okay. there was no there, there was no there was no meat for this. episode, <laughs> So I had to go outside of the box. I'm very sorry. That's OK. We've locked in our <laughs> incorrect answers. And if you'd like to play along, no cheating, no Googling. Set a course for your nearest social media app and post your answer. Use the hashtag Starfleet Challenge. We'll pick out our favorite and um, bestow upon you the highest award that this podcast has to offer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next time on Humanist Trek, Star Trek, the original series, season two, episode nine, Metamorphosis. Live long and prosper. Kapla. Humanist Trek is available wherever you replicate your podcast. Follow us on all the social medias at Humanist Trek. Become a patron at patreon.com slash humanist trek. Open hailing frequencies to podcast at humanist trek.com and visit our website, humanist trek.com. Humanist Trek is a production of Sarah Austin Media.